Thank you, thank you. Oops, <laughs> that woke you up. Woke me, woke me up. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to St. Mark's United Methodist Church. It is a joy to see you here this morning. Uh, we welcome all those who are following us through our live streaming or social media channels. And, and if you're a guest today, uh, we want you to share with us uh, some of your contact information. We want to keep connected with you. Uh, there's some connect cards at the lobby area, and there's also an iPad. Uh, just feel free to share with us the kind of information that is most comfortable for you to, to share so that we can uh, be connected with you uh, in the days, weeks to come. Uh, so as we come today, let's just open ourselves to the presence of God. This is a day that God has created for us uh, to experience his presence. And as we gather as God's community, uh, as a community of faith, uh, we, the Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his, his people. And so we know that as we praise God today, as we worship him today, that God will manifest his presence today. So uh, let's expect that. Let's pray. Uh, dear God, today we uh, open uh, our time together uh, with an open heart, an open opportunity for you uh, to inhabit uh, this space, not just this sanctuary, but also our hearts, our lives. And as we praise you, uh, may your spirit uh, manifest uh, his presence so that we can uh, be transformed, that we can be inspired, we can be uh, changed, and, and, and Lord, that we can start a new uh, relationship with you or, or strengthen our relationship with you. So today we pray for that special blessing as we open in the powerful name of Christ. Amen.
rise for the call of worship. In the northern reaches of Galilee, where shadows yield to the light, Jesus began his ministry, bringing hope to a waiting world. From Capernaum to the surrounding regions, his healing touch and message of redemption echoed. As John the Baptist sought assurance, Jesus responded, the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. In our assembly today, let us open our hearts to the presence of the one who brings light to our darkness and healing to our brokenness. Let the proclamation of Christ's transformative power usher us into this time of worship. May our spirits be stirred and our souls be attuned to the good news that brings liberation and restoration. Please join us in singing our opening hymn, Jesus Calls Us, number 398. Please remain standing for the affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope in life, in death, in life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
of Christ's mercy, where healing flowed and hope blossomed, let us now share the peace that transcends all understanding. As we greet one another, let the spirit of compassion and reconciliation prevail in our words and gestures. May this be more than a simple exchange, but a genuine reflection of the peace that Christ imparts. Let us pass the peace, acknowledging the presence of the healer among us and sharing his love with one another. If you would all please find your ways back to your seats. We're gonna have a special children's moment today. Okay, so let's watch. Okay, so like I said, today we have a special children's moment. Um, like we do every year, we have our Pray Program kids. These children have spent several weeks learning more about God and more about their faith. Um, they do it for the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts and they get awards and they get badges for that. And so today we're recognizing them here for just really wanting to learn more about their faith and really wanting to learn more about God. Their program for today was for this year was called God in Me, and so they got to learn more about God's great love for them and everything he's done for them and how much he just really, truly loves them. So today we have our youth here, and they are going to come and present these kids with their certificates and badges to give them their awards. So go ahead, youth. Come on up. And so here we have Samuel, Anna Victoria, and Joseph. Congratulations, my friends. You did a wonderful job. We are all very, very proud of you. Thank you, congregation, for always showing these kids your love. It really helps them understand what a big family they have here in faith. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. Um, so we have the announcements for this morning, um, but I don't, I'm not sure, I don't have the <laughs> announcements, so does anyone know what the announcements are? Thank you, sorry, I'm filling in for, for Bill this morning. Um, good morning, St. Mark's Church. On this last day of January 2024, at the center of an electric light bulb, there is a vacuum, and when electricity enters the bulb, the filament burns brightly. At our center is our soul, which when free from important thinking can burn brightly with God's presence. Letting go of ego frees us to be transformed by Christ. Surrendering to this miracle in us by the Holy Spirit allows us to burn brightly with love, faith, hope, and joy. This day, let us surrender uh, all to our mighty God and spread the love of Jesus to the world around us. So here are announcements for today. 
So St. Mark's Youth is on a roll. Uh, Super Bowl Sunday will be February 11th. This is your opportunity to purchase a variety of soups from our youth. All proceeds go to help send St. Mark's Youth to Sacramento Summer Camp. And my understanding is they sold out last year, so you want to make sure you get there early to get it this year. Uh, the youth are also collecting food items for the St. Mark's Community Food Pantry. You will find a list of suggested items on the youth page of on our website at loveroad.org. There is a new class just for fourth and fifth grade students called Young Disciples Club 45, held in room 11 during the nine o'clock service. Lots of great activities are planned for this group. And Wednesday Night Live is coming to St. Mark's. This starts February 21st and continues through April 17th. It will begin at 5 o'clock p.m. with a meal. Then we will break up into small groups for study and fun activities, which will end by 8 o'clock p.m. Come enjoy food, fellowship, and fun with our church family and friends. Have a blessed week, St. Mark's, and spread the joy of the Lord. So that's my cue. You know, I've been... There you go. <laughs> Thank you. That was my bad. Okay. Uh, I've been doing a lot of research on, on kingdom since we've been talking about kingdoms, uh, the kingdom of God. Uh, so one of the things I noticed was that uh, ancient kingdoms, uh, one of the things that they would bring to their subjects, the kings would bring to their subjects, was taxation, a lot of tax that they, they would have to pay. And even in a, in a very unfair way, uh, you know, overwhelming uh, taxes that they had to pay, uh, very unfair, very um, detrimental to uh, the, the economy of, of, the, of the household uh, of that time. Uh, I'm not saying about any, any other country in our time, but in ancient times, uh, kingdoms will have that tendency to live off uh, the taxes that they would impose on their subjects. When it comes to the kingdom of God, you know, God approaches wealth in a different way. Because first, everything belongs to God. But then God allows us to manage 90% of what is His. And that's called stewardship, management. And so he allows us to, to manage that 90%. And then he says, uh, then give me the 10% of what is his. And just give it back to him. Uh, and, and so uh, when, when we look at it that way, uh, then nothing is ours, actually. Uh, we're just managing the wealth of God. Uh, you know, when, when I talk about tithe, uh, you need to know that uh, Hill and I have made a commitment to give our 10% uh, for the glory of God. So I'm just sharing this with you uh, to, to let you know that, that I'm not asking you something that I'm not willing to do myself. And, and so we, we to God uh, out of a generous heart, out of a heart that uh, just loves the Lord and, and, and manages the wealth that God has given us, in the best way possible. So think about that as we offer God our gifts today. Dear God, today we uh, open ourselves to you uh, in, in this way. We also uh, worship you by giving you uh, what, is, uh, what we have set in our hearts to give you. Uh, bless it and, and thank you for allowing us to, uh, to manage uh, your wealth and, and, and the things that you have given us uh, as part of your kingdom. And we pray for these things in your name. Amen.
rise for the doxology. Sorry, I apologize. Oh, I see. All I have is this. I don't have the prayer part, so I don't know where it is. Do you know? Oh, here it is. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so uh, we invite you to come to the prayer kneelers as we pray the prayers of the people. In the presence of the one who proclaimed liberty to the captives and healing to the afflicted, let us bring our collective prayers before the throne of grace. For each petition, let our response be, Lord, hear our prayers. For the afflicted and those in the shadow of despair, that they may find solace in the healing touch of Christ. Lord, hear our prayers. For those navigating uncertain paths and seeking the light of guidance, may the wisdom of Christ illuminate their way. Lord, hear our prayers. For the brokenhearted and those burdened by the weight of life's challenges, that they may find comfort in the arms of our compassionate Savior. Lord, hear our prayers. For the church calling, called to be a beacon of hope and a source of healing in a hurt world, Lord, hear our prayers. For leaders and authorities, that they may be inspired by justice, mercy, and the common good. Lord, hear our prayers. Aloud or in the silence of your heart, let us offer our personal intentions and concerns to the Lord. To these names we add Anne, Bill Wilkinson, Wilkinson, Eddie Rivera, El Paso and the United States of America, Grief Share and Divorce Care Groups, Ian Zamudio, Kathy Poulos, Keith Deputy, Liana, Mary Catherine Minix, and Steve McElroy. Gracious God, hear the collective and individual prayers of our people. Grant us the assurance that you are present in our joys and sorrows. And may your grace abound in our lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayers. prayers. Amen. Amen. We lift our prayers to you, knowing that you hear us and will respond to us, just as the disciples had the same assurance as they prayed together the prayer Jesus taught them to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join us in singing our prayer hymn, Jesus, Remember Me, number 488. into 
Please rise as you are able for the scripture reading. It is from Matthew verse 4. I'm sorry, chapter 4, verses 12, 23 through 24, and chapter 11, verses 2 through 5. Jesus begins his ministry in Galilee. Now when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew to Galilee. From that time, Jesus began to proclaim, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, people possessed by demons or having epilepsy or afflicted with paralysis, and he cured them. When John heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by the disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with a skin disease are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. You may be seated. Thank you, Misty. So we have been talking about God's kingdom and, and the way that uh, the, 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 the Bible unfolds for us this uh, wonderful, um, not just a concept, but it is, it's an experience. And we have uh, talked about uh, God's kingdom or, or any kingdom for, for that matter to be a place of influence, activity, and dominion. And so how God works within those three uh, places of activity, influence, and dominion. We also uh, learned about the centrality of, of the practice of prayer and how uh, prayer actually is at the core of, of uh, identity and behavior of those who are members of God's kingdom. And so those, those two are, are uh, very important uh, matters that we need to consider in terms of, of God's kingdom. Today we're going to consider uh, what it means to proclaim the kingdom of God, uh, uh, what takes to proclaim it, and what's, uh, what's the proclamation uh, concept uh, about the kingdom and, and how Jesus actually proclaimed uh, God's kingdom uh, in, the, in, the first, in the first century. But, but actually, uh, we, we, can, uh, we can say that uh, Jesus used like a bifocal approach to, uh, to proclaiming the kingdom of God. So, so if you have a bifocal lenses, uh, so the, the upper part uh, will allow you to see far and, and, and clear, uh, while the lower bottom part of your glasses will allow you to see close items and, and read. Uh, so, so that's a bifocal uh, glasses. So in terms of the God's kingdom and how Jesus proclaimed uh, the kingdom of God, uh, he proclaimed it to the ones right next to him, the audience of the first century, the Jewish people, the common people that he visited for three years in his ministry. And so that audience uh, is, is uh, the bottom part of the bifocal approach. At the same time, Jesus was proclaiming the kingdom for future audiences, just like us today. So whatever is contained in the scripture about the kingdom of God, we are still hearing about it because of that approach that Jesus took, both near and far. And, and based on this bifocal approach of, that Jesus used, uh, we learned that the kingdom of God uh, is, is, is experienced in the present, but it's also manifested in the future. Uh, we learned that God's kingdom is the earthly, earthly reflection of heavenly, uh, of what heaven is like. Uh, we also learned that God's kingdom is just as little as to reside in one's heart and as vast as to fill the whole universe. Uh, we learned that God's kingdom is as natural as Jesus dying physically on a cross and as supernatural as Jesus resurrecting physically from the dead. 
Uh, the kingdom of God is both a mystery difficult to understand and also uh, a revelation readily to be embraced. Uh, the kingdom of God has principles that are visible and, and they, they are visibly unpacked, but then they are progressively unfolded. Uh, so every time that Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God using this bifocal approach, uh, some people really struggle uh, because Jesus was talking to many audiences, not just the one from the first century. But speaking of the first century audience, they, they really struggle when, when Jesus began proclaiming the kingdom because he introduced very different concepts and views about what it means to have a kingdom. And, and many concepts that he shared, concepts that he shared uh, were, were unique, were radical, uh, and at times were very shocking, uh, particularly to the religious leaders of his time and also the, the common people. Uh, you know, for, for those religious leaders, when they heard Jesus teaching about the kingdom of God, it was like a, it was like a theological punch in the face of those religious leaders. Uh, when Jesus shared those teachings to the common people, um, for many of them, it, it just went over their heads. I mean, they just couldn't grasp any or much understanding of what Jesus was trying to say. Uh, and, and to many others, the declarations of Jesus were a little bit confusing, sometimes alarming, and sometimes painful to hear. Uh, take, for instance, what Matthew wrote in his gospel about the very first time that Jesus uh, began proclaiming the kingdom of God. The Bible says in Matthew 4, 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near or has come near. Now, for us, I mean, that's, that's just an easy verse to understand, right? It, it's, it, it's, it's not a challenge for us to hear the words repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. We kind of understand a little bit more than what the original audiences understood. I, I, I'm here to say that I believe that the original audience, when they heard Jesus say that, that was a shocking statement. It was, it was so shocking and, and, and appalling that uh, many of them said, wait a minute, why do I have to repent? Are you calling me to repent? Are you serious about this? Repent of what? I didn't do anything wrong. We are not the problem. Maybe some of the first century uh, Jewish people who heard Jesus say this would think that way. And, and, and let me tell you why they would think this way. Because if we take a closer look at first century life of Jewish people, uh, we would understand why they may probably thinking uh, in, in that way in response to that phrase. Because the Hebrew nation had experienced hundreds and hundreds of years of foreign domination. These years uh, of, of oppression from Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Greeks, and Romans. I mean, those poor people, the Hebrew nation, they did not know anything about freedom. They did not know anything about life uh, and self-determination because one empire after another, they have been oppressed by those kingdoms. And, 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 and they, were, they, were, they were tired. I mean, they were just afflicted and oppressed uh, physically, emotionally, uh, financially. Uh, they, they had their share of oppressive leaders. And at the time that Jesus was there, King Herod, uh, he overtaxed the territories under his dominion. And then Pontius Pilate took advantage of it. And, and he always advanced his own agenda in trying to oppress even more uh, Jewish people. There was also this very unbalanced social structure. Uh, the, you know, the peasantry, the common people, included the small landowners that they would work their own land uh, for their own subsistence. But most of the money, most of the profit, and, and most of the crops and, and harvest would go to, uh, to the wealthy people. And then there were other people like uh, they didn't own their own land, but they were tenants. They would rent. Uh, a, a, a part of the land from the wealthy landlord owners, uh, and then they would pay rent, and on top of that, they would pay taxes, and on top of that, they would 
have very little to, uh, for them to keep uh, for their own families. And then they were the, the ones who just would work uh, the laborers, uh, and, and, and they would just uh, work to, to death, and they, they were not given uh, a good salary, a good wage, uh, and they would have to, to work hard so that the elites, the, the wealthy, uh, the well-connected, the people with influence would, uh, would benefit from uh, the backs of, of those doing the hard labor. So, so you know, it, it, was, it was a difficult life back then. Uh, the, the, the social economic structure was very asymmetrical. I mean, it, it, was, it was just not a, 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 a nice time to live uh, during, during the first century, the Jewish people who first heard of that message. They were truly oppressed. Their freedoms were very limited and at times non-existent. Uh, people lived in a state of hopelessness with very little to look forward to. But then Jesus came saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Excuse me, Jesus, are you asking me to repent? They are the ones who need to repent. All those empires, all those oppressive leaders, all those kings, all those kingdoms, all those leaders, religious and political leaders, they need repenting. I don't need repenting. You know, I have not done anything wrong. They had done wrong to me. Why are you asking me to repent? I mean, you, you, you see the picture here. You, you, you get the picture here that they consider themselves as victims of all that oppression going on. But Jesus was clear. You repent. In the eyes of Jesus, they had to repent because to be part of God's kingdom required a different mindset. Think about the word repentance. You know, to turn about, to have a change of mind and purpose. And this meaning of repentance in the New Testament was a little bit different than the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, uh, the, the, the great tradition of, of, of Moses and the judges and the prophets, they all use the, their call to repentance in a collective way. They, they always would go to, to the whole people, to the whole assembly, uh, to the whole nation, and call for the nation to repent to God. And it was a, a more of a collective call for repentance. But in the New Testament, John the Baptist and Jesus himself introduced a, a, a different call uh, to repentance. It was more an individual call to come and repent and to come to God and change one's mind and, and, and have a, 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 an individual experience of repentance. So those who heard Jesus for the first time would, would have been confused. You know, are you calling me, uh, the individual, to repent? Or do you mean the Hebrew, the Hebrew nation? Uh, besides, I don't need repenting. Those, uh, those other guys need repenting. And so, so, so you see how confusing was just this first phrase when Jesus began proclaiming God's kingdom. Uh, but, but the kingdom of God requires a new way of thinking, a different mindset. It will require a change and transformation. People need to turn around and turn about in their own lives and, and, and embrace a new purpose in life. Uh, and and that's, that's why uh, repentance called for an internal transformation that it was demonstrated with external behaviors. Because we can change our behaviors anytime. I mean, we do that at the beginning of the year, right? Resolutions. Uh, we say, okay, I'm going to stop eating. I'm going to stop. I'm going to start practice, uh, going to, to the gym, exercising. We change our behaviors. About three, four weeks later, we dropped doing that because it's just an external change. We need to do an internal transformation first a change of mindset, a change of disposition of the soul, a, a, a different reworking on our own inner um, concepts so that our behaviors reflect the changes happening inside. So that's, what, uh, that's why Jesus uh, began with that kind of message, repent. It was an internal, an internal uh, call uh, for an internal transformation. So the concept of the kingdom of God was 
illustrated in real life uh, when Jesus was proclaiming God's kingdom inside a house of one of his followers. This is what happened at that moment. So there were people uh, who had a friend who was paralyzed and, and they couldn't find a way in the house. So they managed to go all the way to the roof and they took uh, the part of the roof off and, and they lowered down their friend right in the middle of the room, right in front of Jesus. And when, when that a paralyzed man uh, landed right in front of Jesus, you know, the, the, the first words of Jesus are shocking. Because Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Think about it. <laughs> because even the, the Pharisees who were present and the teachers of the law who were present right there, they were besides themselves. I mean, they just uh, were upset and Jesus knew what they were thinking because they were thinking, who, is, who does he think he is? Uh, this, that's blasphemous talk. God and only God can forgive sins. This guy has no authority to forgive sins. And Jesus knew what they were thinking. So uh, he said, actually, why all this gossipy whispering? Uh, which is simply to say, I forgive your sins, or to say, get up and start walking. Now, think about the friends of this man who had labored and had struggled to bring the friend right in front of Jesus. And they were looking down from the roof, just listening to what Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven. <laughs> so the friend saying, Jesus, we didn't bring this man to be judged a sinner. <laughs> We brought this man so he could be healed. You know, that's common sense, Jesus. But Jesus was looking at the heart. I mean, the, maybe the friends were, were thinking, I mean, this man has been paralyzed for so many years. What kind of sins is, is he able to do? He, he can't move. He can't go to bad places. He can't do things that are wrong because he's paralyzed. What kind of sins has he done? Has he done because he is paralyzed physically? But Jesus knew the heart, and he addressed the first, the first problem, which is the problem of the heart. And then, just to, just to uh, give people a hard time, Jesus said, okay, I'm not gonna just forgive this guy, but I'm going to heal him in front of all of you. <laughs> so he said, get up and walk. And the guy got up and walked and began praising God and, and, and walked in front of everyone, amazing everyone, praising the Lord, went through the, through the crowds. I saw the house praising God, uh, went through the streets, praising the Lord, and went all the way to his house praising God because God had healed him, but also he had been forgiven. I mean, that, that was just the amazing proclamation of Jesus. It was not just a, an external change that God would bring, but it was an internal transformation, one of the heart, one of the soul, that God was interested on doing through Jesus. So, uh, beloved, the proclamation of God's kingdom is, is not going to stop in the exterior of our lives. Uh, in this proclamation, Jesus is going to use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, to call us to repentance. Now, I want us to read together the following verse in Hebrews 4.12. So let's have that uh, on our screens. Hebrews 4.12. Uh, listen, uh, let's do it together. For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even the, the, the soul, the spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I mean, this, this verse gives us a clue that, uh, that the source that is used to proclaim the kingdom of God is the very word of God. And the word of God is like a sword, of, uh, a double-edged uh, sword. Uh, and and, and it, when it hits you, it doesn't bend. <laughs> it, it doesn't fall like, like a plastic sword. I mean, the word of God really penetrates all the way into the soul, to the heart. 
the word of God does, when, when it is proclaimed, when the kingdom of God is proclaimed. And, and so we, we need to understand that that's the whole purpose of, of the proclamation of God's kingdom, to make sure that, that our inner dispositions, that our souls, our spirits, our hearts, our minds are addressed first and are given a chance to, to, to change and to be transformed by the power of God's spirit. Now, let me move to our next and final point for today. Uh, this, this one may be a stretch for, for, for us more than it was for the original audience in the first century. Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God in three ways. He did the preaching, he did the teaching, he did the healing. And that's, you know, you find Jesus uh, in the gospel narratives in, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, usually doing those, those three. Uh, John mentions a little bit of it, but uh, in those other three Gospels, Jesus is actually uh, doing these three as he was proclaiming the kingdom of God. Now, let me, let me say that um, I fear that sometimes the church has ignored two of these three elements, that we have ignored the preaching and the healing uh, I, I feel that sometimes we have settled for, for the teaching part of the proclamation of God's kingdom. I mean, let's just name it. We Methodists are famous for producing very well-educated Christian people. Uh, we have a training course for just about anything. I mean, you name it, we have it. Uh, we, we send our people to be trained for discipleship. We send our people to be trained for servant uh, leadership. We send our people to be trained as lay speakers, uh, as, as lay ministers. Uh, we have Bible studies for, for many people and, and for all kinds of ages. I mean, we are good at it. There's nothing wrong with it. We're, we're pretty good. And, and, and we, we have a very educated constituency regarding Christian life and themes uh, as a denomination. I believe that we have neglected the other two. When was the last time that you preached the gospel to a perfect stranger? Maybe we need to be a, maybe we need to have a teaching course on how to preach the gospel to a, <laughs> Yeah, right? Well, what we will actually have in, in June, we'll have a whole sermon series on sharing, uh, sharing uh, our faith with people. But, you know, what was the last time you were able to share that good news to somebody? You know, preaching, proclaiming God's kingdom is, has not been part of our everyday life as it has been the teaching part of it. Well, and when it comes to the healing part, the signs that follow those who believe, that's when we draw the line. Many people do. Because those signs and those healing experiences are, uh, are, are weird experiences. And then we say, well, uh, all those healing preachers that, are, that, that will charge you money for an exchange for healing, you know, then that's not a good thing. Well, that is a, a very sad thing that is happening in God's kingdom when, when you have those kind of preachers benefiting from uh, this healing ministry. But that doesn't mean that the healing ministry that God allows and in, in, in includes in his kingdom, that, that doesn't mean it's not for us today. Because I believe it is. I believe that God heals in supernatural ways, but I also believe that God provides healing to people in very human ways. Uh, we as a church need to believe and proclaim that God can heal the broken hearts, the, the wounded souls, the crushed spirits, as well as our physical sicknesses. I believe that the way God uh, heals is not as important as the desire that he has to, to, to bring healing to us in our spirits, in our souls, in our, in our bodies. We, we need to remember that uh, healing is part of the proclamation of God's kingdom. And we need to embrace it just as we have embraced teaching, and just as we need to embrace preaching as well. So God's kingdom has not changed. The proclamation is still the same. 
I think we need to be willing to say, God, um, first, I receive the proclamation, meaning I want to repent. If there are things that we need to, to set aside in our lives, need to, uh, things that in our inner lives need to be changed by God, well, so be it. And then we need to embrace the whole proclamation, right? Preaching, healing, teaching. And then we need to do it. So today, our call is um, be open for, for the proclamation of God's kingdom. Be part of it. Because God is, when we proclaim that kind of kingdom, there's no telling to where this church can get. Because we're proclaiming the very word of God that changes people's lives. Pray about this thing and pray with me. Dear God, may your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. May your call to repent be responded by us that we may allow you to come and change everything inside. Everything, mind, spirit, soul, heart, concepts. And then allow us to, to embrace the fullness of the proclamation of your kingdom. Raise up preachers, powerful preachers out of this congregation. Raise up teachers, powerful teachers, anointed teachers from this congregation. And raise up healers, people who would go around uh, the community believing that you can heal the heart, the souls, and the bodies of people. Allow us to proclaim a kingdom that is for us here and now. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's, um, let me offer to you a call to respond to the word. You know, we... We invite you to accept Jesus Christ in your heart if you have not done so. This is important. Professing our faith in Christ is an important step it's probably the most important decision you can make in your life. But for those who are Christians already, but they, uh, maybe you feel that you need some strength in, in certain areas of your life. And, and God has been talking to you in those areas. Maybe this is the day that you need to ask God for that kind of strength. Maybe you've been wondering, what, what can I do in your kingdom? What, what is it that you want me to serve in your kingdom? How I can serve you? And if you need some direction and, and, and guidance from God, you know, uh, God will give it to you if you ask. Maybe today you want to join St. Mark's United Methodist Church. We had one person joining this morning at the 9 uh, o'clock service. If you want to be part of this faith community, you know, we will welcome you. So while we sing our final hymn, we want you to express your commitment. Come and talk to me here or pray, pray with me and, and, and make a decision regarding this particular word you have heard today. Let's stand. Please join us in singing what I have answered when you called.
So we have heard the call of God. God is saying, follow me. Follow him into his kingdom. And then we say, God, your kingdom come. Let your kingdom come. And so that's what we pray this week for all of us as we go out. Let the kingdom of God come through us for the benefit of others. And Lord Jesus, as we have prepared ourselves to uh, go back to our homes and daily life, we, uh, we're taking you with us. We are um, asking that your kingdom will come through us so that others will be blessed. Those who work alongside with us, those who uh, live with us, our, our friends, our families, our co-workers, those who go to school, uh, we pray that you bless those around us through the proclamation of your kingdom. Be with your people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all the people of God say together, Amen. See you next week.